All right, so we continue off. Um, uh, and in this particular screencast, we're just going to walk through a few uh, so-called data preparation tasks that we perform um, alongside data transformation, which is going to mark the end of our discussion of the uh, data preparation phase aligned with the CRISPR-DM model, really. And what we want to do in this particular screencast is just to quickly walk through uh, a Jupyter notebook that has already been prepared. Uh, we're going to walk through some examples of um, data preparation tasks. So things like uh, attribute derivation, for instance, uh, attribute formatting, and how we go about scaling values. And what you notice is that most of, most of these tasks really are more aligned towards the tool that you'd be using. So in this case, we're using Python and Pandas. And so it's, it's really how or what sort of techniques you take advantage of within Pandas and Python to try and, um, to try and work through these different tasks, right? Uh, all right, and we are mostly going to focus on uh, data set number three. We've decided to leave data set number one and number two as an example for you to work through. Um, <clears throat> all right, and as usual, this notebook, the PDF itself and the actual IPython notebook is going to be shared with you alongside the data sets. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, to restart uh, to kill this kernel and just restart it so that we start from scratch, we start executing this cell by cell, or we'll execute this notebook cell by cell. Um, ignore the first two cells here, they're nothing more than a LaTeX markup that allows us to generate the title um, and the table of contents. They're mostly there for the PDF output here. Okay, uh, you probably want to read the introduction at your own time, but uh, the things are essentially just going to focus more on here is how we go about derivate, de deriving the fields, um, uh, formatting the data and to certain extent scaling it so that we normalized attributes that are related to each other. Um, and then finally, how we get to integrate uh, different data sets into one data set. So the maging process itself. Uh, and granted, we've already introduced this whole notion of maging in, I think, the previous screencast and the, the one before that. Uh, but at this stage, really, we'll get, we'll get to um, a phase where we'll mage all our three data sets. Remember, we're working, we working with a data set uh, that has survey responses. Uh, we are working with a data set that has demographic, demographic details of students extracted from a student information system and then finally uh, assessment scores from uh, the final examination uh, the four test scores and the 20 quiz quizzes right so at at the end what we want to do is before we get to a stage where we transform the data set we want to merge all these disparate data sets into one right and then the transformation based on that merged data set uh, and then finally, the transformed mesh data set is what is going to be fed into the estimators that we Im implement as part of the modeling process of the CRISPR-DM uh, model. All right, so again, we're just looking at uh, derivation, uh, scaling, and formatting. Okay, so we'll just run this. Um, I guess this cell has become second nature now. Th this this. This is just there to, to help with the aesthetics associated with the cell outputs of the Jupyter Notebook. Um, this, this is also familiar by now, I, I hope. Uh, just import statements that allow us to import necessary libraries and modules that we want to use within the notebook. All right, so we, we start off by, if you remember, in the previous in the previous screencast, I, I showcased um, how we get to save portions of phases associated with our da data mining pipeline. Um, and we adopted job lib, right? So at this stage, we are more or less continuing off from uh, the data exploration, uh, the, the exploration, exploratory data analysis notebook. And if you remember, the last thing we did was we saved the state of the data sets, right? The pre pros data sets. So what we want to do as a starting point is we want to load uh, the saved states, right? And like I said, loading is pretty easy. All you do is you make reference to 
the file name that has uh, the serialized state that was saved using joblib.dump in this case. Um, and if I can get to, I hope I'm there. Yeah, if I can get the script directory and just uh, order these and I just, I guess I'll pico. Mm -hmm. All right, so you notice that uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five files that have the load state, right? And so what we're doing at this stage is we are loading the details that we saved in these files. And so, so, so lo loading a safe state using JobDB is easy. You specify, of course, you invoke the load function using the JobLib module here, right? So JobLib.load, and then you specify the file which has the safe state. Um, but of course, seeing as you are going to eventually work with the, uh, the safe state, you want a way of making reference to that state. So you just assign this to a variable, right? Uh, so if we l we run this uh, cell here, what you notice once we we try and inspect the columns associated with this data frame, remember at this stage we know that what we have in here is nothing more than the pandas data frame. So if we run the uh, if we run this cell here, we should be able to get the the columns associated with that particular data data frame that was saved, right? Um, and, and and really what you you'd end up doing is doing the same sort of operations that you'd perform on typical pandas data frame. So for instance, we can check, I'm sorry about that, we can check, we can check the number of records observations in this particular data frame. So we see we have 90. We can do fancy things like uh, uh, just uh, view the first couple of records associated with this, let's view the first two records associated with this data frame, and we see that uh, these are the ones, right? Um, transpose them so that the the uh, the view is, is much more readable like that, more user-friendly view. Um, and then we do the same thing for the other data sets. So we load demographic details, right? Just confirm the columns. Um, and like the previous one, we want to just have a sense of uh, the format of the data that we're working with, right? So, boom. Uh, so we do the same thing for the assessments as well. Um, and if you remember, we, we have three different types of assessments. So we have quizzes, we have tests, and then we have the exam, right? So the quizzes or the 20 quizzes were already merged, and so the saved state already has a, a data frame that has all the 20 quizzes, right? And again, if we if we just uh, check the columns associated with these different data frames that were saved in these files, this is the result that we get. So for the quiz, we have the student ID alongside scores associated with quiz one all the way up to quiz 20. For the test, same thing, student ID, test, score, test one score all the way up to test four score. And then for the final exam, we have student ID and the examination score. Uh, all right, uh, so for the, for the um, I guess for the uh, tasks, the data preparation tasks associated with the initial survey and the uh, student demographic, I thought it would be perfect opportunity for us to do it as an exercise. So we're going to do that on the, as an exercise, um, but, but you have uh, cells here that will give you an idea of what you need to do here, uh, trivia stuff really. Uh, so just quickly, get to data set number three, which is the assessment score. So this particular notebook is just going to focus on data set number three. We've left data set number, number one and number two for you to do as an exercise. All right, so we'll start with uh, scaling, right? Now, if, if you remember our description of the data set, uh, when, when we covered pre-processing and the exploratory uh, data analysis uh, phases in the last uh, two notebooks, we made mention of the fact that typically for this particular course, which is a CT1110, the quizzes are graded out of 10, right? These are short in-class quizzes that are normally written within 10 minutes. So they're graded out of 10 marks. The tests are generally 
graded out of 50, right? Uh, the exam is graded out of 100. So if you think about it, you notice that there's, there's a bit of uh, inconsistency in the, in the grade ranges. So one of the uh, scaling tasks that we need to perform is to make sure that all the scores use the same scale. In this case, the scale that we, we, we are obviously going to adopt is a 0 to 100 scale. Um, irrespective of what an assessment is graded out of, you can easily scale it up to 100, right? If you use the percentage scale. So the task would be to scale quizzes to 100 and test to 100. And if you notice, really, what, all we have to do is just say, for all the quizzes, we just multiply the scores by 10. Uh, for the test, we multiply the scores by 2. Uh, for the exam, we don't do anything or uh, another way of thinking about it really, this is primary school stuff, uh, multiply the score by one, right? <clears throat> Great. Um, and to make our life a lot easier, what we're doing in this particular next cell here is, is just uh, defining functions, right? So a function that's going to help us scale the quizzes, a function that's going to help us scale the test. Now, the reason why you want to define a function is because remember the data that you're going to be manipulating is <coughs> is is within a pandas data frame so you need a a more elegant and and i guess effective way of scaling those values um and and python functions are a best way of doing that right uh so you notice that these two functions are just basic functions they take in uh for the first one this function takes in a quiz score and then all it does is it just scales it to 100 um, and of course, the value we are returning here is just uh, down to two decimal places. We do the same thing for test scores. What we're saying is uh, divide the test score by the total, which is 50, multiply by 100, so that it's scaled to 100. Um, and then finally, what we do here is just uh, define uh, two test values for a quiz and a test uh, that we later on use to check that our functions actually work as desired or as expected. Uh, so you notice that if we run um, the, the fx quiz about scaling function on a quiz score with a value of 6, we get 60%. When we run the test function on a value of uh, 29, we get 58%. Essentially, just multiplying by 2, really. All right. Uh, once we do that, we before we start applying these functions we defined, we want to, first of all, gain a sense of the current state of the data frame. In this case, it's the quizzes data frame. So we want to, uh, to render the before view and the after view, right? Uh, so this, these are the scores that we're working with. Um, and then in this particular cell, we, we, we actually loop through each quiz. We loop through each quiz and then we apply the quiz scaling function that would have defined. Now again, you notice that um, uh, we are taking advantage of uh, pandas apply function, which typically is performed on. Uh, okay, it's performed on a pandas series. So, if I can just showcase this, I don't want to mess up or to pollute the Jupyter notebook. So I'm just going to. Um, I'm just going to use the terminal here. So I'll just say import pandas as pd. Um, and then I'll just say help uh, pd dot apply. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to say help pd. I hope I should be able to find the apply function. Not yet. Okay, pd. Let's say pd. I know it's series. pd dot series. Uh, dot apply. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, check if I can gain access. Boom, there we go. Okay, so uh, this is, it's, it's a way, it's, the apply function essentially makes it possible for you to, to, um, to apply a function to a pandas series, right? Um, and if you notice what we are doing when we, when we pull this case and I guess I'm going to have to pollute the data frame here so that this is a lot easier. If if we pull if we pull an example quiz, right? If 
we pull an example quiz here and just say quiz quiz one score yeah let's look at something quiz 11 score if we if we select a particular quiz score if you, if you remember this quizzes data frame has a number of columns right sorry about that a number of columns associated with uh, the quiz scores right so a column for quiz one quiz two all the way up to quiz uh 20. and i went we went ahead of ourselves here uh okay so that's fine <laughs> um so what what we are doing really is for each quiz we are saying we want to get the value of the quiz score which are these things here get these values and then scale them to a hundred percent so you should essentially convert them into a percentage but but when you select a particular column in pandas like so what you get back is a series right uh, so if i check the type of this what you notice is that it's a pandas series yeah so with the pandas series what you can do is you can use a function you can apply a function to a pandas series a predefined function and if you notice in our case we have this predefined quiz function called fx n quiz scaling and the way that you apply that function is like so right if we run this what you notice is boom instead of the one the values one up to 10 you actually have them scaled to 100 right so 60 percent 20 percent right and all this is possible because of the apply function okay uh and i guess i'll i'll have to i don't want it to i want to restart this i'll have to restart this I think this will be a lot easier if we restart this in my opinion anyway data set number three uh anyway, it's fine it's fine i wanted to restart it so that we we get to a stage where the thing we're working with makes sense but i will come back here so this is where we're at so when what we're doing in this particular cell read is we're looping through all the quizzes and for each quiz we get the score and then we scale the score once we scale the score we create a new data frame that is going to represent the scaled value um, and the resulting picture is essentially supposed to be like so if i can create a new it's going to be like so so each quiz will have a corresponding scaled value which is a percentage and we've, we've chosen an, we've chosen a naming convention that clearly um uh, indicates what sort of data is being held by that field so pct is a short form my short form of saying percentage right so a value you have quiz one score quiz one pct or quiz one percentage which is a scaled value just so i've named it quiz one scaled or something right so this is what we're doing here right um, and if you notice if we just take a sneak peek at the values what you notice now is besides the score so for this particular student there's quiz one score and quiz one percentage so one and the percentage equivalent which is 10. Uh, quiz 12 was 10 quiz 12 scaled is 100 right so the student got everything for quiz 12 probably a take home quiz or something um, all right so we do the same thing for tests remember we have four tests so what we want to do is we want to derive a new field that is going to have a scaled value for the test right so for each of these test scores we want to have the equivalent scaled square scaled value so use the same technique we just create a new pandas um, column that is going to be named uh, test uh, followed by the test number and then pct which is the test percentage again if we just uh, check the structure of the test if we test check the structure of this test uh, data frame you notice that it, it has changed from what it was before before we only had uh, five columns id student id test one score test two score test three score and test four score but the new column has four additional fields uh, columns really one represent uh, one representing test one percentage test two percentage test three percentage and test four percentage and just like the quizzes we want to just uh 
take a peek or take a look at the data, right? A, first, a couple of records associated with the new data frame to see if what we've done is actually correct or accurate. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so clearly this, this is fine. Test one score for this particular student is at 1.5. The equivalent percentage of scaled value is 63%, right? All we're doing is we're saying 31.5 times two, which is 3%, right? And again, you'll notice that what we were doing here is we're taking advantage of the function that we defined, fxn test scaling function. Great, so we do the same thing for the exam, but the exam doesn't really uh, require any sort of uh, scaling because um, it's already scaled. But for consistency, what we do is we create another der derived column that's essentially just going to hold the same value as the examination score because the exam is already scaled to 100%. So this is what we're doing here. It's just saying create a new column and then assign it the value of the exam score column, right? And if you run this, you notice that uh, uh, the exam examination data frame has three fields now instead of two. Um, so the score and the percentage, the percentage is the same as the score. All right, um, don't worry about this cell, this scale just uh, makes it possible for us to properly render um, a, a table, right? Markdown table, essentially. Uh, if you open it up, this is how you define tables in Markdown anyways. Um, but anyway, this, so this cell is just there to help us properly align the table to the left, essentially. Right, so, <clears throat> um, Still on data derivations, what you'll notice is that we've, we've derived a couple of fields, the interesting fields like uh, the scale, we've actually, sorry, we've scaled the values. The next step is to try and, uh, we actually scaled the values and also did a derivation of sorts. So um, the derivation is, th this derivation we have here is nothing more than, uh, um, I guess, the new derived col columns represent the equivalent scaled values of the assessment scores essentially, right? So very basic de derivation, derivation, but uh, derivation involving scaling. Um, what we are now going to do is just to quickly walk through yet another example of uh, deriving fields. And what we want to do now is, if you think about it, the scores that we have now, the percentage scores in their own right are not really going to be very useful. So one of the way, one of the things that if you remember uh, our discussion, one of the things we're interested in doing here is to try and predict, say, if a student is going to fail an exam, right? Uh, if a student is going to get a good grade, right? Um, if a student is going to end up getting a particular grade point average, right? So for us to be able to do that, we need to make sure that we derive fields associated with all these different aspects um, that are linked to the score itself. So what we want to do is be able to associate each examination score to these different grades here, A plus all the way up to D, or D to A plus. To be able to determine whether or not a particular score is a fail or a pass, and to identify or to associate a particular grade point average to the score. And I apologize here, this is not the score range. What was I thinking? This is the grade point supposed to be the other way around. Boom. All right, so this is a score range, this is a grade point. Um, all right, so, so what we're going to do is derive these fields for all the scores, for the quizzes, for the tests, and for the exam, right? Again, life is a lot easier if you work with a function, and this is what we're doing in this particular uh, cell here, we're saying this is composed of utility functions for deriving the attributes we want, these attributes, yeah. And, and if you look at these Python functions, these are very basic functions that allow us to determine whether someone passes or fails. Simple function really that involves an if statement, if the score is less than 45%, it's a fail, otherwise it's, it's, it's a pass, right? So we return pass or fail depending on the score. For the uh, grade and the GPA classification, we've just decided to combine those two things into one because it turns out that uh, using this score range, you can easily determine the grade and the associated grade point average. So an A plus is associated with a particular grade point score, yeah? So 
we define a function and what the function is going to do is based on the score it returns a tuple uh, a tuple that has two values the first value uh, or index zero is represented by the actual grade index one is represented by the gpa right uh, so essentially well, if you think if you look at these functions what we're doing is just implementing this if it's an app, if, if it's if a range falls with if a grade a score falls within this range a scaled percentage scaled, scaled grade falls within this range then it is an a plus and it has a grade, grade point score of five right all right so uh finally still in this cell we have um uh, i guess we've just defined a way of uh we have a few statements to test our function right and using a value of 88.5 here we're just saying what do we get back when we get a value of 88 um, and the print, print print statement just has a uh, just a um, dictionary that has a pass status whether it's a pass or fail the grade classification whether it's an a plus b plus or a d or a d plus and the gpa score so if we change this to let's say 44 or 41.5 we know this should be a fail it's a d it has a gpa score of zero if it's a 77 or it's a 59 we know that this is a pass it's a c plus it has a gpa of 2.37 right all right uh so now that we've defined these functions all we have to do is apply or come up with derive the, f the fields we want we're interested in by just applying these functions we've defined here uh, and so what we are going to do is just check the state of for each particular um, data frame we check the state the state currently has the quiz score uh, the scaled the scaled, scaled quiz score which is a percentage right uh, but what we want to do now is to add additional columns so three columns a column that is going to indicate whether that grade is a pass whether that score is a pass or a fail a column that's going to indicate whether that score is <coughs> a d a d plus a c c plus b b plus or a a plus and a column that's going to hold the gpa score associated with that particular uh, assessment score again very trivial to do we just loop for quizzes we loop through all the quizzes for each quiz we are saying uh, define a new column sorry define a, a new column so we're going to have a quiz n status quiz n grade quiz n gpa where n is the number of the quiz so for instance quiz one status quiz one grade quiz one gpa right and as we are looping we we apply those different those two functions so the status function and the gpa the G, the 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 grade gpa classification function a reminder that the grade gpa classification function returns a tuple that has the grade and the gpa score right so which is why um which is why we are we are getting index zero here and index one here all right so once we do that if we check if we check the the new uh, quiz quizzes data frame what we will notice is that it has uh, it has a couple of additional columns right now pandas is a way of uh, using this ellipse uh, using this ellipse to or these dots really to signal the fact that there are more columns here but if we take a peek at the the new quiz um, the new quiz data frame you notice that it has status grade and the gpa so observe for quiz 11 if we go for this particular student he got a four four is scaled to uh he got a four four is scaled to 40 obviously but if we come here and check the status it's a fail it's a d it has a gpa score of zero right so we're doing this for all the quizzes for each student yeah so we do the same thing for test scores what we want to do is we want to derive for each of the four test scores we derive the equivalent status whether it's a pass or a fail the grade classification d d plus c c plus b b plus a a plus and the gpa 
uh, GPS score, right? Uh, this is what we're doing here. Um, just check how much time we have. Okay, we still have a bit of time. Almost 30, 30 minutes done so far. Okay, so we, we do the same thing. Um, you notice that if we take a peek at the structure of the data frame, new structure of the data frame, you notice that it has a couple of additional columns, right? Those uh, derived columns. So the status, the grade, and the GPA. Um, and we can also inspect uh, some sample records to just see, let me just take a peek at two of them, to try and see, um, try and see uh, or confirm that the derivation process actually does make sense. So you notice here that uh, besides the scaled uh, score, we also have the status for each of the quizzes. Let's see if there are any, pa any fails here. It's a bit weird that they all passes. I'll just go with the tail. Uh, oof. All right, we have a, a fail here. So this particular student uh, passed test test one, yeah, uh, passed test three. Where's test two? Failed test two and failed test four. Right, so interesting stuff here. But for this particular student, uh, they passed test one, failed test two, failed test three, failed test four. Ooh, weird, bad student here. Okay. Well, not really bad student. We, we don't know what happened here, but uh, certainly not a model student. <coughs> Take back the bad part. All right, so again, for the exam score, we do the same thing. All we are doing is we are applying the function that classifies whether a grade is a fail or pass, classifies whether it's a D, D plus, C, C plus, B, B plus, A, A plus, and classifies the score, GPS score associated with the score itself. So we, did, we do the same thing, we check the structure of the new data frame, and we notice that, uh, oof, we notice that uh, the derived columns are there, right? Status, grade, and GPA. And we can again take a peek at the exam score, and boom, we see that they're there. Oh, it's a bit weird that these were all... So this is this is a bit strange. We will have to fix the functions at some stage. The status says uh, it's a pass, but the uh, the examination grade is a D plus here. So we, we need to uh, fix this. It's it's just a it's it's it's, a, it's an issue to do with the boundaries. If you really look at this, I'm sure it has something to do with the fact that uh, I'm guessing. I'm curious now. The boundaries we're working with on the uh, this is weird. I'm curious, and the problem is on the D plus. <laughs> if it's greater than forty nine, if it's greater than forty four, no, it's actually fine. It's fine. I, I think the problem is uh yeah we've kind of messed up this it's this would be 49 45 to 49 44 here <coughs> so don't know if i'm tired but the, the boundaries i'm working with don't make sense oh shit they don't make sense here this is a uh, that thing on silent apologize for that um so we check if the score is greater or equal to 90 it's that greater or equal to 89 greater or 79 69 59 49 for 44 greater or equal to 44 greater or equal to 44 I'm wondering if um, I should have used the ranges. If it's greater than 89, greater than... Okay, I see where the problem is. So if you notice, I, I was using the upper bounds instead of the lower bounds, right? So I should have been working with the lower bounds. I do apologize. So less than 90, uh, stupid mistake, less than 80, 
seventy sixty fifty I should be working with the lower bounds, not the upper bounds. Fifty forty five the hell forty five fifty forty five forty five forty perfect forty all right so so that uh, and we'll have to rerun this uh, I do apologize for that we'll have to rerun this um, and we'll get to that stage where if just take note if you notice the uh, the students that we're working with here and I hope the arrangement of the cells is going to be preserved but uh, I'm sure the issue was when we were checking the exam scores for this particular student what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a screenshot of this thing here oh, mouse batteries oh my goodness mouse batteries acting up and uh, shit okay uh, delete me please I need to get rid of that okay uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just, to, just going to quickly restart the whole process here. I'll clear the output and then I'll just rerun everything up to that point in time. We just want to verify that the the new thresholds actually do make sense. Uh, and if I can just quickly get to the part that I was working on. Come on, come on. Perfect. Great. Hopefully that works just fine. Okay. I want to get to the exams here. I think the exam thing is the part that. And, and of course, I mean, so for some of these things, as you're going through all these different processes, by the time you get to the part where you transform the data, you'd have verified that the the different operations that you're making onto the data themselves do make sense, right? Um, <clears throat> So you want to make sure that you verify those things. Boom. Okay. So check that. And all right. So this makes sense now. So this particular score, if you if you remember, we previously had classified it as being. Uh, if you remember this nine D five one one, nine D five one one. This is just a screenshot. 95d 95d11 if you remember previously it was classified as as a d plus but it's actually a c right so the problem was uh, i guess a logical error associated with the functions the bounds that i was working with i was working with the upper bounds instead of the lower bounds it's a bit strange here i suppose i was tired when i was doing that okay so um turns out that there's really nothing to format here in terms of the data data right uh so what we're going to do is continue off and just merge the data sets, right? And at this stage, we want to combine all the different data sets. So the data sets associated with the survey responses, the demographic details, and the quiz score, so that we have one contiguous data frame that we're going to work with. Um, and again, uh, we've seen this before. It's just a matter of if you want, you can do it piecewise, two frames at, the, at two data frames at a time. So combine data frame one and two get the output and then combine output of one and two with three, get the output, combine output of one, two and three to combine with four up to up to the last data frame. Remember we have five data frames, right? Initial survey, demographic details, tests, quizzes, examinations, All right? Um, so the final output should be something like this. Beautiful. If you look at, um, if you look at what we have right now, we have everything in one data frame uh, details to do with the survey right timestamps student names and everything else details to do with demographic details put from sis um, and then more importantly the scores right um, and really mentioned from the onset when we introduced this data set that one of the things we'd be interested in as far as this data set is concerned here is to try and see if there's a causal effect when you compare the independent variables such as demographic details and the result, maybe the exam, maybe the test scores, um, um, why you'd be able to do that is entirely dependent on the sort of problem you're solving. 
It could be that you want to determine midway through the course who is most likely to perform poorly uh, in the final exams so that you come up with targeted interventions and try and fix the problem before it's too late, right? Um, but of course, I mean, there's the, if you look at this data set we're working with, there's, there's a ton of um, different problems that you can extract from here. Uh, perhaps issues to do with gender representation, right? Um, can we introduce some deliberate mechanisms in place using some of the results that we're going to get from here? Uh, and also, once we get to a stage where we discuss um, uh, clustering, for instance, you notice that using this particular data that we currently have, we can easily apply some clustering techniques to try and see if we can come up with different patterns associated with the data. Using those patterns, we can extract, or well, not extract, but come up with problems that we can potentially solve, right? But anyway, so this is the final, the final data frame that we have. It has a, a total of... Um, Let's try and uh, not do that, but let's try and uh, let's try and uh, confirm how many columns we have in this particular data frame. And just create a new cell up here and just say columns, right? So we have a total of uh, what the hell? We have a total of. Uh, I guess that would be like 150 columns, right? So 150, that's a bit strange, 50. Could be, actually. Yeah, 150 columns that we have, right? Now, granted, I mean, some of these columns are redundant. Um, and if you remember, before you actually transform the data, you'd have gone through a stage where you identify useful attributes that you want to incorporate into the model implementation process, right? So, for instance, if you look at uh, uh, things like you have a percentage and the score. The percentage and the score actually do the same thing. They represent the continuous data associated with the different scores, right? Uh, so one of them can go. Uh, if it were up to me, I would probably get rid of the score and just maintain the percentage. Um, uh, what else? Uh, there are a number of redundant fields, right? Uh, again, as a part of the process where you choose which things to include, you notice that things like timestamps would not really be important. Student name, why, why would you need a student name? The ID would not be important. It's only there to uniquely identify the different observations that you, are, uh, you have as part of your data frame that you're working with, right? All right, so we'll proceed and uh, uh, just to check how many observations. I was just doing a few checks here to check how many records actually have associated, um, associated uh, what do you call this, uh, survey responses. Because the survey that we conduct at the beginning of the year is optional. Uh, and you can tell here by just counting the number of, observ of observations in the entire data frame. Uh, and this keeps happening. I'll just, I wonder why. I'll just do that. You see we have uh, 123 observations, but out of the 123 observations, only 63 of them have uh, survey responses. Now, now, using this, you can already start making decisions to say um, decisions like, is it really necessary for us to, to, to use data attributes from survey, seeing as uh, the responses only represent, they only represent 51% of the entire observations that we have, right? Um, what might make sense is perhaps do an analysis that is just focused on the 63 observations, right? Do a separate analysis that has all the 123 observations. Granted, at some stage, we, we have a discussion where we we get to uh, emphasize the importance of the size of the data set, right? It turns out that the size of the data set actually gets to influence how accurate your model uh, is going to be, right? So it's important things to take into account. Uh, so what I was doing here is just trying to filter out those with uh, responses. All right, um, and then we do uh, yet another uh, EDA process. And now this EDA process uh, has both independent variables and dependent variables. Uh, remember, remember that uh, most of the most of these things that you're going to end up doing, right, um, uh, are going to involve you trying to identify sort of like potential uh, cause and effect relationships that exist in your data set, right? So things like uh, do uh, does the gender influence the scores? I know it's a, probably a political 
uh, I want to get an, an argument here. So that's an example, right? We use a different argument. Does does the fact that a student is accommodated on campus influence the overall resulting scores, right? And if you notice, what we'd be doing to, to try and check that sort of uh, cause and effect relationship between the accommodation status and the final exam score, for instance, um, involves making use of demographic information and the exam score, which is the result, right? So we're just going to go through uh, a few EDA uh, a few EDA processes here. Uh, I guess a few cells that have some uh, EDA tasks that we want to perform. So in this case, we just do a very superficial gender analysis and try and see, say, uh, what is the mean score associated with the two genders that we have? Uh, fortunately, in this part of the world in Zambia, we only have two genders, right? No, no binary here or non-binary is not here. Uh, okay, this is the point. But you notice that uh, all we are doing is I'm um, just grouping here in line number four here in this cell, cell 51. I'm, I'm grouping my data set by gender, and then I'm extracting the examination percentage, and then I get the mean score, right? So for each gender, I get the mean score. And I notice that uh, on average, uh, not sure why, but males perform, perform better than females. And, and already you can see that maybe you might be interested in doing an in-depth analysis based on this observation. Right, to say um, what sort of additional factors influence this sort of performance, right? Why is it that females perform, uh, do not perform as well as males on average? Could it be that uh, it has something to do with, and I'll take you back to the survey responses, it has something to do with the motivation for why these people chose to do this course, right? So, so these are all interesting things to think about. But key thing here is we're doing this sort of EDA process to try and identify potential cause and effect relationships that exist. Uh, so we do the same thing for computing experience, right? Not computing experience, this is, this is minor. Jesus Christ, effect of uh, program minors. Great, so for program minors, we try and again, we're checking that's the mean scores. And we can notice here, right? Interesting things here, ignore the missing data here. We have a, uh, records that don't have the specified minor. And again, using this, we can easily try and follow through with our source and try and see if we can find out why we have missing data here and perhaps try and fix this problem. But we can already notice that there, there are some interesting observations made. For instance, on average, the people minoring in mathematics perform better, followed by those doing English. So interesting questions to ask here is why is it that the people pursuing maths as a minor perform better. Uh, seeing as this is a, a computing oriented course, I mean, um, uh, we, we, can, we can make educated guesses like perhaps uh, due to the analytical nature of maths, this particular course is somewhat more bearable for uh, people that are doing maths, right? So, but I don't know, I mean, so, but perhaps, perhaps one of the reasons this might be the case is could be that uh, the people doing maths don't have as many courses to work with. An interesting thing to, an interesting thing to, um, to note about the courses at UNSA is that uh, depending on the type of program you're pursuing in a given year or in a given term, you might have a uh, fewer number of courses than others, right? Um, I, I do know that for certain departments in the School of Education, uh, we have a sort of situation where we have a number of half courses, right? So in a given term, you'd find a student having, uh, let's say, five courses, for instance, or even six courses, right? Now, I, maybe I should I should pull up that, in, that I should pull up this data so that I uh, I hope it helps explain what I'm trying to point I'm trying to put across here. If only I can oh boom and I have this information right here. I hope no need to mask these students here. There's nothing sensitive about that, but observe, right? So what you notice is that uh, for these different students that you can see here, this is what I meant. And if I can just filter out uh, Christ, if I can just I'll cut this off, just in case people are be a bit sensitive about sharing this information. <coughs> oh, shit. Okay, I will. Mm, okay. 
uh, my interest is to filter out people doing ICTs just because uh, the, the program we're working with just because it will make sense that's the data set we're working with I just want to give people an idea I wonder if there's a way of uh, So what I'm trying to see is count the number of courses, right? I want to d have a derived field number of courses uh, just to see if the workload, maybe maybe the performance of maths might have little to do with what Lighton uh, put forth as an educated guess. It might have little to do with the fact that maths is more an analytical subject and so that it helps people understand this. Could be that maybe these students have less workload, right? Uh, but I'm just curious here and we'll check this together. Let's see if we can check the number of, uh, I wonder if I can count the number of courses. Mm. And uh, I'm trying to And check uh, uh, by the way I'll, I'll probably fast forward this part or some something like that I'm just curious if I can quickly come up with a way of uh, counting the number of uh, occurrence of a particular trim search one text search B I wonder, I'm surprised that there, there isn't an Excel function that helps to to count uh, to count the number of characters. Find. How about index? I wonder. Index, index, <coughs> it has to do with index, maybe. So let's try and check if I can find the index. Index. Okay, I'm just going to do something very stupid, but uh, and I'll probably laugh at myself when I look this up online. I don't use uh, the spreadsheet applications as often as I would want to, but let's see if we can do this. So I just want to see if my uh, if we can come up with, ooh, I shouldn't have done that. They saved this. I'll have to undo this eventually. Uh, but I'll just say, uh, I'm going to check. Okay, I'll find uh, <coughs> I'll find uh, I'll find a comma. Ooh, I'll find Jesus Christ. I'll find uh, I'll find a comma in here. Give some text stats. I guess indexing begins at one here. Okay, so I'll find the index of the comma, and then uh, you know what? This is stupid, really. I shouldn't have. <laughs> I shouldn't have done this, but. I'll, I'll do something unorthodox here. I will just say uh, delete this, do something really stupid, something I wouldn't otherwise do, but I'll say 
uh, just change this to text to column and then I'll say split them by commas and then boom um, and then I shouldn't have that it can be done program programmatically I suppose but uh, I'll try and check to see if there we go this is what I wanted I want to get to the stage where I uh, and I'm sorry about the noise of unruly kids in this part of Jesus town that I stay in uh, so I will I'm trying to get to I want to get a sense of where the last column is so there we go J K Ooh. we have columns throughout all here I wonder who allows who allows people to do these number of courses Ooh. P as well Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the, the last record is at P here. Alright, so it's at P and then I'm going to, if it's at P, I'm going to come back here, expand this, and then I'm just going to say, boom, and then just say, uh, number of courses and just do that and then i'll say count and then I'll, I'll count from e up to p in fact i'll count from e up to z who cares right uh, key up to z so i'm counting these entries here so you know these four courses here um and I'm going to go down all the way and just copy this thing across up to the last record, which hopefully is here. Ah, shit. Uh, sorry about that. Scroll down up to the last part. The stupid mouse, what is happening here? Fine, the gods want to mess with us and use keyboard all right so just going to scroll all the way down and then okay and then just copy across the formula right uh, the idea by the way here is I, I just I got curious here I want to I want to um, perfect so I now have a field that represents the number of courses, right? So what, what, I, what I meant when, when I said, and I'll just copy this across here so that I don't pollute the previous spreadsheet. And uh, I hope I haven't saved this thing. I'll undo this and just don't save. All right, so, so you notice that what we can do, right? What we can do is for each student to try and verify our initial assumption that, oh, well, perhaps the the reason why the maths people perform better is not because they are more analytical, they're introduced to these analytical concepts, so it could be that maybe they have the less workload, right? And we can determine the workload by counting the number of courses that each student does, or each student enrolled into 1110 uh, did. And so what I would do is I'll also filter, I'll filter out what I want and I'm interested in uh, in these people here. I undo everything. I'm just interested in these people here. Perfect. Now we see what uh, is happening here. So we can sorry about that. We can easily try and map onto uh, onto the different students these the workload that they have and you can notice here that we have some students that have a workload of six eight seven courses nine courses i don't know who allows someone to do nine courses in a given year ten courses right uh, so an assumption to make is that uh, well maybe uh, maybe maybe the workload has an effect right maybe the workload has an effect uh, so something to think about but besides the point we do the same thing for uh, for um, 
computing experience. So do we think that perhaps the fact that someone who enrolls into this course has prior computing experience has an influence on the overall outcomes, right? So uh, we do a simple ADA process to try and find out. Well, looking at the data set that we have, we see that many, actually the, the people, the, the average score for those without any computing experience is the most, it's the highest, right? So perhaps this doesn't really have uh, that much of a, of a bearing really, right? And, and really just by looking at the results that we have here, um, we notice that there isn't really that much of an interesting causal effect uh, insofar as computing experience is concerned. So we might just decide to say, we scrap this off. We don't need to include it at all because it's pointless to include it, right? Um, or perhaps something else we could do is maybe categorize these these uh, this, the, these different uh, these different ordinal uh, these different my mouse battery is dying sorry. What we could do is instead of having a you know, instead of having these different uh, bands here, what we would say we just cluster them based on no experience and experience. So with experience, without experience, but still, I mean, so. We s there, there could be some some bearing on the results if um, if we were to look at the causal effect associated with uh, or, or really the yeah w when we look at other assessments like the quizzes are not the final exam the final exam is written at the end of the year at which point most students even those without experience would have learned how to use a computer right but perhaps the picture might be different if we try and look at uh, the impact that having experience to a computer might have on test one scores or the first couple of quizzes that are written, right? Again, these are really uh, things that we introduce as uh, what if questions to ask as you are performing this EDA process, right? So accommodation, oh, it looks like uh, those that are accommodated perform better on average, right? So maybe this is worth exploring, right? Uh, we, we have had, the reason why we included this into this analysis, by the way, for this particular project is We've, we've had uh, students uh, complain about staying off campus, you know, especially when it comes to scheduling tutorials and other interactions early in the morning or, or uh, perhaps late in the evenings or something or on the, over the weekends. Um, I guess the last thing we'd wa want to do is to include all oh, religious affiliation, right? That would be crazy. I don't know. But, but, but I mean, there's no harm, right? In you, the thing is, collect as much data as you can. Um, at some stage, you get to filter out undesirable attributes. Feature selection. So as part of a feature extraction process where you select the features you want to work with, get as many attributes as you can possibly get, and then go through a process of elimination where you exclude undesirable attributes. All right, so in terms of other colorations th that we can perform, or the causal effect things we can perform is, um, in our case, we're asking ourselves questions like, can we, ident can we be able to come up with a relationship between the tests that are written and the exam? Uh, are we able to determine who is less likely to perform better at the end of the year in the final exam by looking at what sort of score they got in test one or test two? If that's the case, then maybe we can have targeted interventions once test one and test two is written, right? Hopefully that kind of makes sense. So simple scatter plot here, we notice that uh, really not so convincing here for test one score, uh, just because the performance is hovering around, most of the students are hovering around the 40, 60 mark here. But I want to draw attention to I wonder what sort of observations we can make here. By the way, the y-axis representing the scores for the test, the x-axis represents the exam scores. So you you notice that the distribution of students that are clustered, so the, the students that perform on average, that get average scores, like uh, let's say 45 to 50 mark, who get more or less the same score, in the exam, if you notice here, right? Um, I'm looking for cause I think that's much better. This is again, this is not very, it's not very helpful. I guess, I guess, I don't know. Maybe the situation might change if you look at uh, quizzes, really. Um, but what I would be interested in doing myself is maybe doing some sort of cluster analysis to cluster these different students, right, for each particular test score. 
Um, and the problematic students here, if you notice, would be this cluster here that's getting scores that are less than 45%, right? So if you notice, if you look at this, most of the students that are here will typically get the same mark in the exam. They are somewhere here and here. So they failed the test, they'll get a low score in the exam. So maybe what you could do is say, uh, to try and figure out ways in which you can try and uh, focus more on these problematic students here, right? So that they don't fail anyway. Okay, so we do the same thing for the quizzes. We try and identify some sort of uh, cause and effect on the quizzes. And the reason we're interested in the quizzes, by the way, is we had mentioned, again, I'm sorry about the noise, the kids outside. Uh, <coughs> I need a soundproof room. But, but um, the, the, the thing to note here is, one, one thing to think about is, can you map the different topics to the final score in the exam? So can you identify which topics most of those students that fail in the exam have issues with and be able to fix them, right? You can do that by looking at the scores in the quiz because our quizzes are based on specific topics, right? So you notice here there's some pattern, right? Uh, for some quizzes, uh, you can clearly see here, right? So you'd be focusing for this particular, I don't know what quiz 13 is, which topic this is, but if we check it, we'd be able to figure out that, well, most of those that, f there are some people that filled topics related to quiz number 13 that didn't perform as well in the final exam, right? Uh, but the bottom line really is you, 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 you do another EDA process that is focused on trying to identify cause and effect relationships. And those are important because they will help you identify what variables or what features to include um, as part of your model implementation phase, right? All right, so I hope this was useful. I am going to share this Jupyter Notebook um, and hopefully we can have a discussion about this uh, in our next scheduled live interaction. Great, thanks. Uh, oh, sorry, by the way, you want to make sure that you go through the exercises in here, exercises associated with initial survey and uh, um, and the uh, demographic data. If you notice, we didn't derive any fields for these fields. So one of the things you could do here is for the demographic data, for instance, you want to derive something like the age, the age from the date of birth, right? Maybe that might be useful. Uh, you want to sort of like uh, try and see if you can derive uh, sponsorship details or something. Um, okay, you want to work through these examples because th what we're covering next is only going to make sense if you're able to follow through with this. Great, thanks. Uh, enjoy and